I am a big fan of the Kirby games. Sure, they all follow a basic structure with fairly samey gameplay, but they get a pass due to how incredibly charming they all are. There's something so pure about a cute pink blob creature consuming equally cute enemies and, in most instalments, taking their powers. Even Kirby's creation was kind of adorable. A lot of video games will insert a simple placeholder sprite in place of a fleshed out protagonist during a game's development, but Kirby's creator, Masahiro Sakurai, fell in love with the little puffball as he was. The original name planned for our gluttonous hero was going to be Popopo, but it was later decided to name the hero after John Kirby, one of Nintendo's lawyers. So with that, let's take a look at Kirby's Game Boy debut and its two sequels. First off is Kirby's Dream Land, one of my favourite platformers. Recently we compared two superheroes, Dashing Super Guy and Kirby from Nintendo. In some ways, Kirby lost big. No big hair, no big muscles, no weapons, nothing. All Kirby's got is appetite. Kirby's Dream Land, the thrilling new adventure game on Game Boy. As you can see by the Western box art here, Kirby hadn't really settled into his signature pink colour, instead appearing in the same monochrome that he would on the Game Boy screen. On top of that, Kirby isn't able to take advantage of his copy ability yet, meaning that all you can do to your foes is swallow them up and then either spit them out as star projectiles or swallow them alive. Kirby's Dream Land has a very straightforward, no-nonsense plot. You are Kirby. You like to eat. Some greedy Penguin King named DDD is hoarding all the food in the world. So, quite simply, you need to defeat all of his subjects and claim the food back. You start your quest in the most iconic and redundantly named Kirby level of all time, Green Greens. You then move on to several equally idyllic lands such as Castle Lololo, Float Islands and Bubbly Clouds before storming Mount DDD. Yeah, as you can see, I'm not going to worry about spoilers in these videos. These games don't have masterfully crafted narratives. The actual platforming in this game is incredibly easy due to the fact that Kirby has infinite flight, meaning that the difficulty comes from the enemies you encounter. At first you get enemies like the Waddle Dees, who are pretty passive, doing their own thing for the most part. But as you push on, you'll encounter tougher goons who will chase you down and give you a run for your money. Most enemies can be devoured, but it's getting them into your mouth without taking damage that can prove tricky. The bosses, on the other hand, are a whole different beast. Bosses cannot be hurt directly, so what you need to do is essentially counter-attack them. Almost all of the bosses provide you with ammunition that you need to use against them. You're usually given a few seconds to inhale the ammo and spit it back at the boss to deal damage. This is a cool system in that it relies on you to learn the boss's patterns and attack accordingly, but as a downside, it can cause battles to drag on. Anyways, defeating a boss nets you with the best prize you could ask of a video game, a prize that we need to see more often. No, I don't mean the shiny collectible, I mean the cool dance! Why don't more video game characters celebrate with dances? Kirby's Dream Land is a neat little portion of fun, boasting simple graphics, addictive gameplay, and stellar music. I'd say the only real downside to this game is its length, you really can beat it within an hour. However, for those of you bored by how easy the game is, there is actually a built-in solution. By holding up A and select on the title screen, you can access an extra mode, which replaces all enemies with stronger counterparts, and heavily increases the boss difficulty. Would I recommend Kirby's Dream Land? Um, yeah sure, why not? I'd say this game would be fun for short train rides or car journeys. Assuming you aren't driving, of course. 
The game was also heavily influential, not just for its direct sequels, but for the Kirby series as a whole. There are a ton of callbacks in this game in later Kirby outings, with the most notable being a full remake found in Kirby Superstar, and an enhanced remake of the extra mode found in Kirby Superstar Ultra. This game isn't too hard to get your hands on, so I implore you to give it a visit, I'm sure you'll love it. But how is the second game though? I hardly ever hear people talk about it, so do we have another Final Fantasy 2 on our hands? Friends are there to pick you up when you're feeling a little down. Friends are there to rearrange someone's face when they're acting like a clown. Friends are a hamster, a fish, and an owl in Kirby's Dreamland 2. If you ain't fighting on their side, well, man, I'd pity you. Kirby's back in the family one brought three rowdy friends. It's a pumped up, powered up Kirby in Kirby's Dreamland 2. You'll be glad to hear that we certainly do not. Well, not from a low quality standpoint at the very least. Kirby's Dreamland 2 does a lot to distance itself from the first game, but the results are very fun to play with. The big gimmick this time around is that Kirby can now team up with one of three animal friends. Rick the Hamster, who can run real fast, Koo the Owl, who can improve your flight capabilities, and Kine, 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 Kine the Fish, who can carry Kirby in his mouth and swim through rapids. On top of reworking your mobility, your current animal friend also changes the copy ability Kirby currently wields, and with 7 abilities to be found, this allows Kirby to access one of 27 unique attacks. The amount of choice you're given to tackle every situation is unreal, and experimenting with those choices is unbelievably fun. So what's the story this time around? Well, Dreamland is being threatened by an otherworldly evil named Dark Matter, who possesses DDD and destroys the rainbow bridges that hold Dreamland together. So this time, your goal is to collect rainbow drops, exercise DDD, and banish Dark Matter. Unlike the first Dreamland, which was strictly linear, this game offers an overworld user interface. In simple terms, this means you can revisit levels you've already beaten, and hopefully find all the hidden secrets to gain 100% completion. For real, beating DDD without all the hidden rainbow drops actually nets you a bad ending. If you do have all the drops though, the battle with DDD takes a sharp turn, unleashing Dark Matter himself, and prompting an incredibly tough aerial sword fight as the final battle. Even though it was Kirby's adventure that started the trend, this follows one of my favourite Kirby staples, secret final bosses who are unfittingly dark and hard to beat, but more on that later. Anyways, defeating Dark Matter saves the day for real. If you want a real challenge after that, your next step is to unlock the boss rush mode. In this mode, you have to be every single boss using just one life. You have fun with that trial, I have other things to do. By which I mean anything else. So that's Kirby's Dreamland 2. It adds just enough new elements to revitalise and reinvent Kirby. Highly recommended for everyone. That leaves us with just one more game in the Dreamland trilogy. Kirby's Dreamland 3. What? No cheesy advert? Oh man, those are the best part! So Kirby's Dreamland 3. This game came as something of a surprise as it was released for the Super Nintendo in 1997, making it one of the last big titles Nintendo even released on that system. This game expanded on the Dark Matter plotline, offered co-op gameplay, and had one of the most adorable art styles I've ever seen in a game making your whole adventure look like a children's crayon drawing. The very definition of innocence. Well, until you get to the ending. To go into more detail, this game stars Kirby and his friend Gooey. Gooey's powers and abilities are equal to Kirby's, with the one major cosmetic difference being that he slurps enemies instead of inhaling them. 
Kirby and Gooey's adventure is spurred on by the return of Dark Matter, but this time, he big. And he doesn't just possess DDD, he actually plagues the entirety of Dreamland with a corrupting influence. I guess this is the plot justification for why the land is plagued with enemies, even though it kind of always is. Anyways, this game is like an enhanced version of the second, with a few extra features and elements to keep things fresh. The biggest additions coming in the form of three new animal friends, Nago the cat, Choo Choo the octopus, and Pitch the bird. Starting to sound like the cast of a Sonic game right here. Between his total of six allies and eight copy abilities, Kirby's number of potential attacks clocks in at a whopping 56. So, uh, have fun with those. There are five massive worlds to explore in this game, all of which can be revisited to find secrets, just like before. This time though, you need to satisfy the needs of friendly NPCs, which is usually something of a puzzle considering that they don't talk. Figuring out how to appease all of the NPCs in any given world will earn you a heart star, and just like the rainbow drops from before, heart stars need to be collected in order to face the final boss and get the good ending. So how does this game end? Well, halfway through the traditional DDD fight, things get weird, borderline grotesque, with DDD's stomach, or possibly his crotch, spouting teeth and belching darkness everywhere. When you do finally beat him with heart stars in hand, you take a trip to the Hyper Zone to finish the job. You then take on a Dark Matter using your Love Love Stick, which I'm happy to confirm is not a sexual euphemism. Once Dark Matter goes down though, the game isn't over. In fact, it takes a very sinister turn. You encounter a being of pure evil named Zero, who is implied to have control, authority, or maybe even kinship over Dark Matter. I'm not sure to be honest, Zero is clouded in mystery, but... Ugh, ugh, okay, okay, I, I need to address this. I'm squeamish about eyes. I straight up can't deal with Igor. And Zero is a giant eyeball that bleeds profusely. He straight up hemorrhages to death. I, I can't deal with looking at this guy for any length of time before sympathy pains kind of overwhelm me. Yeah, he's genuinely the grossest thing I've ever encountered in a video game. And it's a Kirby game of all things. Okay, beat zero, day is saved, let's move on. So, what are my thoughts on KDL3? As I'm sure the cool kids call it. Well, I'd definitely recommend this one, but mostly if you have a cool friend to play it with. Kirby games make for great co-op experiences with their simple but varied gameplay, and surprisingly few take advantage of this. So grab a friend and give the game a shot if you haven't already. I can near enough guarantee you'll have a good time. This takes us neatly to the end of the video, since there aren't any more Kirby Dreamland games. Not direct sequels at any rate. Except there totally is. Kirby 64, which could be considered the fourth Dreamland game due to its continuation of Zero's plotline and its similarly cute art style. But hey, I think I'll leave that one for another time. We've got a bunch of other games to cover. Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed this nostalgic revisit of my favourite puffball. If you like this video, please donate to my Patreon. If you want to hear me spout nonsense, please follow my Twitter. And if you want to fight, I'll meet you behind the bike shed at 3, nerd. Uh, anyways, thanks for watching and I'll see you all later.